the night of the Passover feast, an annual celebration, an annual holiday where families got together and they remembered what God did to, to bring the Jewish people out of Egypt and just all the, all the crazy things that God, great miracles that happened. It's, it's, it's really it's a time of bitterness and celebration at, at the same time. And Jesus has his disciples uh, find a private room where they can meet. See, this is going to be his last one. They don't know that. His disciples don't know that, but Jesus knows this. He knows this is the very last time that he will celebrate the Passover feast with them. And uh, he, he, he does what's called the Last Supper. We just participated in it. It continues to, to this day. But they, they find a room for um, them to meet in, and the disciples make their way to the rented room. They hang out a little bit. They get inside the room. There's these awkward moments where, you know, they're, they're just, hey, small talk, and then that kind of thing is going on. And uh, that, that they're, as they're standing around, as they're, they're waiting for people to get settled, they're waiting for a big event. Usually, someone comes in, this is custom, it happens all the time, someone would come in, a servant would come in, and they would wash their feet. They've been traveling, their feet are dirty, all the stuff in the Middle East, everything. And, and, and so they're all kind of standing around, just kind of waiting, like, well, maybe they're late, maybe they're at a stoplight, uh, who knows, got pulled over, the camel was too fast. I mean, you know, trying to figure out what in the world, and, and, and they're, they're, they're stalling, but nothing's happening. Now, as you may know, this is the job of a foot washer is like the lowest in the totem pole, right? It's the lowest in the pecking order. The servant does this, right? It, it, it's a way below the job description of the disciples. I mean, it, it, that's not even on their radar. I mean, they're, they're just not going to do it. So they're standing, they're waiting, they're getting a little bit uh, annoyed. Uh, that, you know, like, where, where is this guy? They finally, someone makes a move, they all sit down at the table. And at this point, some of them are probably a little bit agitated that their feet are still dirty. This is the big event. This is the big meal. We've gathered for the holiday. Our feet are dirty. What is wrong with this place? What a terrible place to rent. Who, who's providing this meal? All these things are going through their mind. And we don't know exactly what the table looked like. I, I can guarantee it does not look like the famous painting. It, it could have been a couple of slabs of wood on the floor, or it could have been slightly elevated like, like this, and they would recline against the table. If you had a lot of money, there might be some really nice uh, cushions to recline on, but generally, probably, and that's not where they were. They were at a rental place. And, and, and so this is the room they're in, and they're waiting to begin the big Passover meal. And, and some of them are probably upset that their holiday is going to be ruined because the meal is ruined because they don't have their feet cleaned and, and, and the whole thing. I can imagine Peter. He, he's kind of the man of action, and he's probably sitting there just annoyed, thinking, man, would someone please come and wash our feet, not realizing he could do that. Like, that's just not even, that's not even in his thought. Any of them could have done it. No, no, you, but that's not what you do. You don't, you don't do that. For other, it's for, it's important people don't wash feet. And, and so Jesus, you know who Jesus is, right? <laughs> Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God of wonders we just sang about. Uh, the one whom every knee in heaven on earth will bow before him at some point. You know, I, I mean, because he's the top. There's no one above him. Jesus, of all people, gets up, takes off his outer, outer garments so he doesn't get him dirty, takes a pitcher, pours some water in a bowl, gets down on his knees, and starts washing the feet of the disciples. Like, what? And, and then he gently dries them off, puts his outer garments back on, goes back to his place at the table, and says, you all know what just happened here, right? You understand what I'm doing, right? He had, a, he had a huge lesson that he needed his disciples to know. It's in John chapter 13, little context, uh, verse 12, and he had washed their feet, put on his outer garments, and resumed his place. He said, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. You're right, for so I am. I am the top dog in this room, as a matter of fact, by label and title. Yes, that's who I am. Verse 14, if then, if I then, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also do just as I have done to you. Now, I believe Jesus really means those words. Anybody with me? I mean, right? He, he didn't say that, like trying to fill time, trying to stall before the soldiers come. I mean, no, he, he really meant these words. I want you to do what I just did. Not necessarily the feet 
didn't, but, but the servants get to get the idea of what he was doing. He wanted them to catch that. Now, last week I said we started this series on, on legacy, and we're talking about five things that we can pass on to our children if we're parents. Little did I know on week one of this I would have a grandchild. I mean, that wasn't even on the radar when this thing was planned. Uh, so what timing, Brody, way to go, right? Um, uh, I mean, so, so week one, Brody's here. He's here today. Hello, Brody. I get to mention him because he's, you know, all right. Uh, <laughs> And, and so, so we're going to include grandparents, too. You can have an influence on your grandkids. Parents, you're going to have the biggest influence on your children. So we're talking about five things to hand down to, to your children. And one of them is this idea of servanthood, of, of, of having a heart for other people. I mentioned last week that, that this whole idea of parenthood is really discipleship or discipling. Or it's a long-term discipleship relationship that you're in. And I, I believe in any discipleship relationship, relationship, so if you don't have children or grandchildren, just relate this to discipleship, right? In any discipleship relationship, one of the key things you want to teach people about being a person who follows Jesus is having a heart for people. It's becoming a person who is a, a servant. Now, most of us are not nearly as concerned about training our children to be servants as we are as training them to be goats. Right? We want our kids to be, you know the goat is, right? Greatest of all time. We want our child to be the greatest ever in whatever it is they do. Right? Uh, they, they should be the Michael Jordan. Uh, they should be the, you know, the, the Mozart. You know, if it's in music or if it's in academics, they should be the Einstein. We want them to be the top, the, one, the best ever. You know, we want them to, to be that. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily bad. I mean, you want to encourage your children to excel and, and to do things. I know from experience that that, as parents, that in your heart, it drives you. You want them to succeed in, in those things. I mean, you, you know, you, you have to watch yourself on, on this. I wanted my daughters to be the best ball players. I wanted them to have the solos, the best ones. I wanted them to have the, you know, in, whether it was music or in, in concerts, vocally, whatever. I wanted their names highlighted in the program and for the teachers to say, you know, these, these students are okay. But this one, you know, <laughs> I'd say, mine, mine, you know, that, that, that doesn't happen in the real world a whole lot. But I wanted, you want your kids to be the goat. Uh, we, we, uh, we did everything we could to help our children be the goat. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, we, we looked at Danielle as, as a young child and said, you know, she, can, she has a voice. She, 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 kind of, she has a voice. And, and so we, 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 we helped her. Uh, we got vocal lessons from, from someone who, who was uh, very, very skilled in, in vocal lessons. Uh, when she went to college, we, we introduced her to a guy, who, who, a music director, who was just one of the best out there. He was responsible for several Dove Awards. Uh, he, he got her on the stage to sing with the Gaithers. Uh, uh, she sang in Carnegie Hall. I mean, she got experiences that a lot of people don't get to have because of the people that, that she was trained under and, and with. Uh, Shanna's uh, same situation. Uh, she wasn't in the vocal, she was in the band. So, so when she decided on bass clarinet, we, and she was doing well, uh, we, we, we got her the best coach out there. You had to, you, I mean, you, you had to like audition to be, to be uh, a student of this woman. She plays for the Des Moines Symphony. And then we bought her like the best instrument that you could get. Uh, um, yes, they're expensive. And, and, and it was so good that when she got to college and decided, I'm, I'm really going to focus on academics and not music, she sold her bass clarinet to her teacher. So if you ever want to hear Shanna's bass clarinet, go to the Des Moines Symphony. That's where it's at. Um, she, she is in the symphony. Uh, so it, it was a good, it, point is it wasn't the one you get at Kmart, right? I mean, it, 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 was, it was a good instrument to help her su succeed, right? So I'm all about giving our children the best opportunities and the best path towards success. But, but, we can never forget our higher calling. Higher calling. Goat is really great, but our higher calling is to pass on to our children the heart for other people. We are called to teach them to be servants, not prima donnas. I mean, that's, 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 if they became goats, and didn't have a heart for people, we would have failed uh, as, as parents. Jesus said to a group of elite leaders, like the top, top of the top, best of the best leaders in Israel at that time, he said in Matthew 23, the greatest among you will be your servant. Well, that's above their pay grade. They have servants, right? What do you mean? 
I need to be a servant. He said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So the best way, among the other stuff that you do, do all this stuff, that's great. But the best way to truly teach your children to be the greatest is to teach them to be a servant. That's, that's key. That is key in their life. Now, the disciples heard Jesus say this. It's not like, you know, they'd, I mean, he, he, they'd been with him for three years at this point when they're in that rented room waiting for the foot washer. They'd been with him. They'd heard him. I'm sure he said it multiple more times than what it was just written down in this one little snapshot for us. He often told people to be servants. They heard it, but they must have thought that was for other people because they didn't catch it. They, they didn't get it. There they were wondering who was going to wash their feet when there should have been a competition to see who would do it first. Yeah, they were just irritated. Oh, the holiday's ruined. Uh, this is going to be a good Passover. Uh. They didn't catch it. So how do you pass it on? How do you, how do you pass on the idea of being a servant to your children. Here, here are some observations, I think. Uh, but for, from the text, really, I guess, yeah, pretty much. Uh, number one, you need to model it. Model it. <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus couldn't just teach it. I mean, we know he taught it. We just read a verse where he had said it out loud. The disciples were there. They heard him say I mean, they know he had taught. We know he had taught it, but they still didn't catch it. He needed to model it. So after three years of personal discipleship, by, by Jesus himself, everyone still in that room was looking for someone else to wash their feet. They may not even be consciously thinking it. I mean, they probably wouldn't have said, oh yeah, this is what I was thinking. But every single one of them thought they were above the menial task of washing feet. No way am I going to do that. Where's the servant? Come on. What's going on? Why isn't this getting done? And so Jesus doesn't sit them down and lecture them, although he does you know, go look at it, give them a little information. He, he grabs the water and starts washing their feet. Now, now if you read the full text, Peter, Peter resists. He said, well, 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 you can't, you can't, you, I mean, you, you're the top. You can't wash my feet. He didn't say it that way. He said, you can't do this. And Jesus says, well, if I don't do it, you're not with me. Well, well Peter's fully in. So he's like, all right, then wash my hands on my head. <laughs> I mean, let's, I mean, let's, let's, go, let's go all the way if we're going to do this. You know? And Jesus is like, nah, nah, you're missing the point. I'm not giving you a bath, my friend. I'm teaching you a lesson. <laughs> Teaching you, you don't, you don't need a bath. You've already had that. He wasn't concerned, Jesus wasn't, with cleanliness. That wasn't the point. His concern was that these men were about to transition into people of authority, a people of, of leadership. They were going to be the foundational leaders of the first century church. They would be teachers and influencers of the first century, but they weren't ready for it. As much teaching and training and discipleship as they had, they weren't ready because they all thought they were above foot washing. They all thought they were all above menial tasks, and Jesus knew that would be a problem. You don't get leadership. I read this this week and thought it was significant. I just wanted to put it on the screen. It's not an outline or anything. It's just important. Serving is not something we do. It's something that reflects who we are. It's just not, it's not a to-do list. Oh, okay, I served this. I did that. I did four acts of service. Okay. It's, it's who you are. It's, it, it defines who you are. The last person you want as a leader in the church is someone who thinks they're above nursery. The last person you want as a leader in a church is someone who says, I will not pull the weeds. Someone, someone else needs to do that. Okay. The last person you want leading. The last person. Because it means they don't understand what Jesus said about leadership. And they don't understand what it means to be a servant and have a servant's heart. And, and so Jesus had to show his disciples what being a servant looked like by doing the most menial task anyone could think of. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to do the servant's job. He had to show them it's okay to go below your pay grade to serve someone else, to help someone else out. You know what? The last thing we need as parents, grandparents, the last thing we need is to raise a generation of, of, of children who become adults, who grow up into thinking that uh, uh, they are above serving people. Or, or that, even worse, everyone owes it to them to serve them. That, that's, that, that'd, be, that'd be a mistake. That'd be a mistake. So model, model servanthood to your children. Let them see you prepare meals that you're going to deliver to someone's house. 
maybe even go with you. Let them see you help someone out with a project. Let them see you clean the church building. Whatever it is, whatever the things you do that, that you're doing to serve, let them be a part of that. Let them see it and witness it. You're modeling servanthood uh, to your kids. That's kind of catching. At some point, they go, oh, that's just normal. That's what we do. That's, I mean, you know, it's, 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 you know it's, it's what we do. Secondly, uh, after you let them see him, you, you do still have to teach it. You've got to use your words. You've still got to say something. Uh, Jesus did teach it. He did say it. And I mean, after modeling, he did say, you know what I've done. Remember that stuff we talked about? Yeah, all these years, leadership and servanthood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he put it all, tied it all together for them. Now, you don't have to teach a big lesson. Actually, he, I don't think, it doesn't look like he brought out a whiteboard in the three-point outline. I mean, he, he just... He just Related, to, to, related it to the situation. And you could do the same thing as a parent. Simple explanation. Hey, Mom, why are we taking potato, potato casserole over to Ken's house? Well, he was in the hospital. He had a bum knee. He, had a, you know, he missed a few days. You know, that's how we're washing his feet. Unless you'd rather wash his feet. No, we'll take the potato, potato casserole. <laughs> potato casserole. <laughs> uh, that's how we do that. Or you can even be more elaborate and, 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 and relate to other stories in the Bible. Who doesn't want to hear the story of Dorcas? What kid doesn't want to hear about Dorcas? I, I mean, oh, Dorcas? It's going to be about Dorcas, right? I mean, I love that name. And he goes, well, you, know, you know, Dorcas, right? She, this is a lady who was like just this incredible servant. She made things for people and, and served people and, and, and just gave her whole heart and soul to people so much that the, everybody knew her. She, somehow she had touched everybody's life in some way, in some act of service. Time goes by, she gets sick, she dies, and the whole community is mourning her death. And, and somebody finds out that Peter's nearby, and they say, go get Peter and bring Peter. I don't know what they're thinking is going to happen, but they bring Peter over. And, and Peter uh, goes up to her bed where she's dead, and, and, and he sees the grief in people that it's, it's more than normal. It's like it's a bigger thing. People are bringing articles of clothes that, that she made to him, saying, look what she did. My life is not, you know, it's, my quality of life is going to lower because she's not here. And he prays and brings her back from the dead. It's like, whoa. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty impressive, just because she was a servant. Just because she was a servant. So, yeah. Uh, the last tip is uh, invaluable. You model it, you teach it, and you invite them. Invite them in. Invite them with you. Basic discipleship in anything you're teaching. I mean, it's inviting them to be part of the, of the process. And this, this is how you help make it a legacy for future generations. It's beyond, hey, Dorcas was a great servant. It's Dorcas's kids. Wow, look at them go. It's, it's beyond you, mom. Oh, mom was great. Dad was great. It's children picking up the baton and, and, and running with that, and then their children after them and their children after them. When your per kids get to personally process what a servant does, because you've invited them with you, and, you're, and, and you're, you're, you, know, you just talk about what you're doing, you're, 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 you're doing it together, it, it is invaluable. It helps them process what's going on. It helps it, things stick tighter when, when you're doing it, when you're getting your fingers dirty, and, and you, you, you know, cut your finger peeling the potato for Ken, you know, it's Darn Ken. But, but, but then you learn something. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Do you even get potato salad? I don't know. <laughs> he needs some potato casserole, guys. <laughs> uh, I mean, but it, it, you, you feel it. And you, it becomes part of who you are. I love, I love when we do our mobile food outreach uh, events. We've done a, We really started them this year. We're going to expand them, as, as you heard, next year. But we just went to an apartment complex of, of, of lower-income families. And, but that, that we just, they, it was a time of tension. And it was like, hey, we just love you. We just want to say, hey, you know. And, and um, I love it when our kids go with us. Because what do they do? They sit down with other kids. And, and they're just people talking. They're building relationships. They're tearing down walls that they don't even know are there. Or, or, you know, they're just, they're just, it's, it's, it's just people to people. It is so wonderful. That, what does that do? It creates a, a, a desire to do it again. It's like, that wasn't that painful. That didn't hurt. I thought it might be, but it wasn't so bad. And, and they seem like just normal human beings. And, and it's inviting you with you. It, it catches, it catches. I love all, seeing all of our people do that, but, but it, it just touched my heart more to see our kids doing that. So, so what do you do? You, you find what your kids are interested in, and, and you kind of feed off of that. When Danielle was young, I could tell she was gifted for singing. I mentioned that, that earlier. And, and, and so what did I do? I invited her well, to camp with me when I was leading worship at camp a lot. Um, and then she was, she'd come along and pick up her guitar, and she could sing and be a part of it. It was so non-threatening 
I mean, they didn't even know if you sang off key, which she never did, but, or played the wrong chord. I'm sure that happened. Um, you, know, you know, I mean, she, she didn't, they didn't know you were nervous. You were just kids hanging out, leading, leading worship. And then she got older, you got into like high school, pretty soon she's picking up a guitar and leading. And then, of course, and now she's, she's doing it uh, as an adult. Because why? It caught. Something in there caught. They said, hey, not only do I want to uh, do it at camp, I think I want to be trained and went to college and learned stuff about it so that she could learn to do it more effectively. And it, 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 why? It wasn't to, to get a job, but so she could serve. She could serve. Um, when Shanna was younger, she, she was more into working with her hands. She, was, she, she could sing, but it wasn't that. I don't know if you're intimidated when your older sister is like, getting all these awards and stuff. I suppose I would have been. Um, but but uh, she, she just liked to use her hands, so we came up with opportunities. Uh, she, she, she loved hard manual labor. Um, look at that happy smile. <laughs> That was a great day. <laughs> uh, you didn't know the rocks across the street. She, she shoveled those things, tons of rocks with a little shovel. I helped a little bit, but, but she, you know, she, really, she really went at it, and she was ready to quit. And we just went a little further, a little longer. Um, and, and then when, uh, I suppose it was before we did the rocks, we were working on drywall, and, and not everybody has time to do drywall. So I did a lot of drywall in there. And so I said, hey, come out with me. She just wanted to learn. She, she screwed a lot of the drywall in. She did mud. And she learned a ton of stuff about drywall. And she, we had fun doing it. But what happened was, as she got older then, what was it, a couple years ago, we went to uh, North Carolina when there was a hurricane and people's houses were destroyed. And I said, hey, we're going to take a trip if anybody wants to go. She was the first one to say, yeah, we're going. So she jumps on. And, and there she is. We're using the big painter. And she's doing, this is a stranger's house in North Carolina. Um, who, who, who were, were just waiting, they were living in campers in their yards in the months afterwards. So we went in and we redid completely two houses that week. Um, and, and she was on the team because of, of her heart to serve came from what she had learned earlier. So we invited her along to be a part of, of, of the process. Now somehow we, we, we managed successfully to raise two young women who have a heart to serve. You even look at the fields of, of work they're going into. It's a service type thing. It's medical, but it's, but it's, but it's, but it's service. Um, I believe that was through discipleship. It was through living it, right? It, it, was, it was through modeling it and teaching it and having opportunities to be uh, in, involved with it. Now, here, here was my struggle this week that I was trying to, trying to figure out there's something missing, right? Because we can provide a service project. Hey, we're going to go do a meal for a couple hours. Come with it. And you can come and you can check it off and say, yes, I did a project and that's great. How do you move from a service project to becoming a heart to serve? Because there, there is a jump. It's going from head to heart, right? Going from, yeah, I should do this. Yeah, I checked it off. Okay, I plan to make it to, I really want to help people. How, how, how do you make that jump? And, and this is just me processing. I don't have like a Bible verse for this or anything. This is just me looking at what, 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 what have we done in Christian discipleship and in parenting. And here's what I'd say. Don't forget to debrief. How do you, don't forget to debrief. Uh, anybody participating in, uh, anybody can participate in a service project. We all can. I mean, we, we do it all the time. But how do you get from that to your heart? I think it's the, the little conversations that happen in the debriefing. When we take, we've taken several teams to Zimbabwe now, and, and I can tell who's there as a service project and who's there as a servant. There, there, there's, there's a difference. They're, they're both great and valuable, but the goal, my challenge as, as leading the group is to go from, let's take them out of just doing a trip, just doing a, a mission thing, to I'm fully in love with any, and it doesn't have to be just about anywhere. I'm fully, I love people so much, I want to pour my life into them. I, how, how do you do that? Well, we do a number of things, like in, in the Zimbabwe thing, we have pre-meetings and talk and dream and plan and talk about what we want to accomplish and all that kind of stuff. The mission uh, fundraisers we do, that's, we don't make a lot of money from it, but the part of that is just for them to work together and, and as a team and get to know each other better. The big thing, the big thing, uh, anybody, talk to anybody who, who's gone with us, is what we do when we're in Zim, Zimbabwe. Every single night, we sit down, even though we're all exhausted and everybody's tired and they want to go to bed, we sit down and we debrief. And we go around the circle, we have a little devotion time and prayer time, but then we'll, we'll like say, okay, what did you see God do today? What, what happened today that was a God moment? And it is so exciting to hear people, well, I saw this, I did this, I had that conversation. They go around and we can see what God accomplished 
through our group rather than, well, I, can't, I don't know, I just like served Kool-Aid. I don't know. I mean, you know, it, the one person doing one thing may not be a big deal, but when you put the whole group together and you have this conversation, you can see people's hearts melting and saying, man, we, we, uh, we literally made an impact on some people today. We genuinely touched some people from God. Uh, we have actual real relationships with some of these people. And, and it moves them. There's that's something in there moves them from the head of, yeah, we're doing a vision trip too. Man, I love these people. I can't wait to go back. Whether it's Zimbabwe or whether it's across the street or whether it's picking up communion cups here. I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter. It, it, the transition of, of going from, from head to heart. So if you take your kids along to some of the mission, uh, missions we do around here, local things, have the conversation. You don't, you don't have to have a formal sit down at the end of the evening where you pass a little baton and everybody talk. Uh, we, don't, we don't pass anything. Um, maybe we did one year. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, just, just have the, hey, how'd it go? What'd you think? Did you, what kind of conversations did you have? Did you make any friends? Just, just, just have the conversation and be able to tweak, hey, what could you do better next time? How do you think this could improve? And, and that debriefing, it engages them more to think beyond, yeah, I just did something. I don't know, I just think there's something about the debriefing that happens. And I know that happened a lot with our family. Uh, we'd do something, whether it was drywall or go to camp, and we'd have conversations. Hey, how'd that go? Boy, that was a bummer. You know, why is anybody else in this? doesn't really matter. You know, did you have fun doing it? I mean, you know, you have all those questions, and, and uh, it, 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 it helps create that heart uh, for, for serving people. You can do that in a small group. You can do that in your family. You can do it with any, any, any group. Right? It doesn't have to be formal. Ask the questions. So here, here's what we're doing. Next, next, next week, we're going we're to continue on in this series about leaving a legacy, talking about um, a, uh, uh, a faith that really isn't shaken in times. You know, uh, what happens if, if the person I don't like gets elected? What happens if there's a virus? What happens if I lose my job? What happens if uh, somebody takes away the car? Or whatever, you know, stuff that happens. You're like, whoa. Um, this is how you pass on to your children an unshakable faith, and we're going to talk about that um, next week, a trust, an unshakable trust in God.